Hello, good afternoon. Uh, my name's Philip, and I'm part of the. Uh, good. Uh, oh, hello, good afternoon. Uh, my name's Philip, and I'm part of the team at Salisbury Library. Um, and welcome to this afternoon's tea and chat. Um, we've got some poetry and some prose this afternoon, and I've got some book recommendations. We've got lots of new books here at Salisbury Library. I've got a few. I picked up a few. That I thought I would tell you about. We've also got a podcast recommendation and a few discoveries. So I thought I'd put all these together and um, share them with you. So the first thing that I discovered um, when I was doing some research for this uh, little chat was something called poetryatlas.com. And this is called Mapping the World in Poetry. And I thought, wow, this is really good. And although it's American, you can type in you know, what, whichever part of the world you're in, and find out a poet who's near you. You can do it by geography or poets. And the one I found, I obviously went to Wiltshire, and I came across a poet called Alfred Williams. And in my ignorance, I hadn't come across that that author before. And Alfred Williams, I've got an old book that I found in the reference library. This is Alfred Williams, his life and work, and he was born in um, what is now almost part of Swindon. And it was a Wiltshire village of South Marsden, 1877, and he was a poet and an expert on the Wiltshire countryside. And for 22 years, he worked in the uh, stamping shop. He was a hammer man at the Great Western Railway Works at Swindon. And he was also a prolific poet. And he was also um, knew a lot about nature, so I thought I would read one of his poems for you. So this is from Alfred Williams, and this poem is called Winter. O oh, winter, loving and majestical, breathless, compassionate, mysterious, nature's reflection, the old earth's idleness, mother of glooms and shadows, free, tempestuous. Raging and fearful, now brooding and solitary. Now is thy time and season, thy throne and government. The wind howls in the forest, the cloud hangs over the valley. The sun creeps along the hill early to rest. The round moon comes up over the dale, the stars glimmer and set. The brown earth ponders, the woods mourn musically. The yearlings crowd in the stall. The bared oak quivers. The chattering rooks dig among the leaves for acorns. The thrush is mute in the bush. The blackbird sits still on the bank. The redbreast pipes cheerfully. The pheasant holds his perch in the tree. Now the ice is over the pool. The frost glitters on the window. Suddenly the night comes down. The evening bell arises. The fire crackles on the hearth and the log emits an odour. The children's faces beam with delight, watching the flames go up. The good wife sets the table, hailing her spouse from labour. The crisp brown loaf, golden butter from the dairy, the hot steaming cup, cheerful and delicious, and the strong dish of welcome, sure domestic comfort. These are thy offerings, thy dear compensations, in which my universal mind delights as one in reason and temperament. Long may I walk the fields and terraces, fresh with the creeping frost salubrious, while the wind beats in secret contemplation, wearing a heart as strong against misfortune as the clear, cutting breath that smites my forehead. So that was um, a poem called uh, by Alfred Williams called Winter and this is a discovery that I made um, using something called poetryatlas.com and this was mapping the world with poetry so I was quite pleased to discover this now um, uh, I would uh, recommend you have a search we've got some of Alfred Williams's uh, information about him um, in some of our libraries and at the History Centre is worth um, having a look at. It's a very prolific poet and is Wiltshire born and bred, so worth looking at. That's Alfred Williams. Okay. Okay. So 
I thought I'd mention a podcast that I came across the other day, and I haven't listened to all of them, but um, this is by Frank Skinner, and obviously it's um, he's trying to make uh, the poetry as accessible as possible. And he's done various podcasts. Um, he's done one about Robert Frost. He's done one about Matthew, Matthew Ald, or Arnold. He's done one about W. H. Auden. Um, and his latest one is um, it's entitled Batman, Captain America, and Milton's Paradise Lost. So quite a ground, a lot of ground to be covered there. So I'd, I'd recommend them. I think they're worth trying. And yeah, the, uh, discover something new in a in a familiar and friendly fashion. So that's our Frank Skinner's poetry podcast. Um, I'd, ha I'd I'd recommend that. Okay. So I thought we'd have a bit of um, Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Now, when I was um, a small boy, um, I'm sure many small boys uh, or uh, young children came across um, Greece and. Uh, Olivia Newton-John and all that sort of thing and um, one of the songs she sang mentioned Xanadu and at that point I thought what Xanadu that's worth <laughs> uh, worth finding out and of course it relates to the poem Kubla Khan by Samuel Taylor Coleridge and it relates to his uh, sacred pleasure dome that he uh, <coughs> he wants to wants to wants to build so I thought I'd read Kubla Khan by Samuel Taylor Coleridge in Xanadu de Kublai Khan, a stately pleasure dome decree, where Alpha's sacred river ran, through caverns measureless to man, down to a sunless sea, so twice five miles of fertile ground, with walls and towers were girdled round, and there were gardens bright with sinuous rills, where blossomed many an incense-bearing tree, and here were forests ancient as the hills, enfolding sunny spots of greenery but oh that deep romantic chasm which slanted down the green hill athwart a cedarn cover a savage place as holy and enchanted as e'er beneath a waning moon was haunted by a woman wailing for her demon lover and from this chasm with ceaseless turmoil seething as if this earth in fast thick pants were breathing a mighty fountain moment, momently was forced, amid whose swift half intermittent burst huge fragments vaulted like rebounding hail, or chaffy grain beneath the thresher's flail, and mid these dancing rocks at once and ever it flung up momentarily the sacred river, five miles meandering with a mazy motion, through wood and dale the sacred river ran, then reached the caverns measureless to man and sank in tumult to a lifeless ocean and mid this tumult Kubla heard from far ancestral voices prophesying war the shadow of the dome of pleasure floated midway on the waves where was heard the mingled measure from the fountain and the caves it was a miracle of rare device a sunny pleasure dome with caves of ice, a damsel with a dulcimer in a vision once I saw. It was an Abyssinian maid, and on her dulcimer she played, singing of Mount Abora. Could I revive within me her symphony and song? To such a de delight twould win me, that with music loud and long, I would build that dome in air that sunny dome, those caves of ice, and all who heard should set them there, and all should cry, beware, beware, his flashing eyes, his floating hair, weave a circle round him thrice, and close your eyes with holy dread, for he on honey dew hath fed, and drunk the milk of paradise. So there we are, that's Samuel Coleridge in his version of uh, Kublai Khan, and the Pleasure Domes. I have to admit, I was really impressed that, no, never mind um, coming across Xanadu from um, Olivia Newton John, one of my colleagues, I mentioned I was going to do this poem, and she then promptly quoted the, fir um, the, fir the beginning of this poem. So I was really impressed that after all this time, I'm sure many of you learnt poetry at school, 
and she she um, she could do that. So well done, my colleague Rosie, who may, who, who did that. So that was Kubla Khan by Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Okay, so we've gone from um, somewhere ooh, quite heavenly and romantic, and I thought we'd go completely the other way. And of course, um, Thomas Hardy is always good for a bit of misery, so <laughs> I thought we'd go and we'd go and have a look at the convergence of the twain. And this is lines on the loss of the Titanic. In a solitude of the sea, deep from human vanity, and the pride of life that planned her, steely crouches she. Steel chambers late the pyres of her salamandrine fires, cold currents thrid and turn to rhythmic tidal lyres. Over the mirrors meant to glass the opulent, the sea worm crawls, grotesque, slimed, dumb, indifferent. Jewels in joy designed to ravish the sensuous mind, like lightness all their sparkles bleared and black and blind. Dim moon-eyed fishes near gaze at the gilded gear and query what does this vaingloriousness down here? While while was fashioning this creature of cleaving wing, the eminent will that stirs and urges everything. Prepared a sinister mate for her so gaily great, <coughs> excuse me, a shape of ice for the time far and disassociate. And as the smart ship grew in stature, grace and hue, in shadowy silent distance grew the iceberg too. Alien they seemed to be, no mortal eye could see the intimate welding of their later history, or sign that they were bent by a past coincident on being a non twin halves of one August event till the spinner of the years said now and each one hears and consummation comes and jars to hemispheres hemispheres I love that like last line where the, the two immovable objects clash into each other um, so that was the convergence of the twain lines on the loss of the Titanic by Thomas Hardy. Okay, so we've recently um, got a lot of new books here at Salisbury Library, non-fiction books this is, and the whole team chipped in and put their suggestions and we came up with some really interesting books, so I thought I would share some of those with you. Um, all these books are available, um, on, you can request them if you don't live in Salisbury, you want to come to your library. Um, and some of them will eventually go around and change to other parts of the county. So the first book I was going to share with you <coughs> was uh, called The Secret History of English Spas, and that's by Melanie King. And um, this does what it says on the tin, and it looks at spas around Britain. Obviously there's quite a substantial chapter on Bath. Um, and about the development of spas, it mentions places like Tunbridge Wells, and Buxton in Derbyshire. It's quite beautifully illustrated. Um, it's quite a, it's not a weighty book in terms of, it's quite a straightforward read. I've had a flip for it and it's quite readable. And of course, for those of you who know Wiltshire well, and perhaps those of you who live in Melksham, you know that Melksham was at one time uh, touted, they were trying to make it into a spa, and there is a spa road in Melksham, and if you go to Melksham, there's still some beautiful large bath-like houses on the outskirts of the town. Um, so we did tr try to have a spa in Wiltshire, um, in Melksham, but it never quite took off, Bath took over. So I, I would recommend this book, it's got beautiful um, pictures and, um, and maps and, and covers most of the spas in Britain. And this is called The Secret History of English Spas by Melanie King. You can see it's got a beautiful cover. That's that one. And another one I thought I'd share with you, um, and this is um, a well-known uh, performer on Radio 4 particularly, and this is David Sedaris, The Best of Me. And if you've never heard or tried David Sedaris, and you want you want to laugh, then he's really good. And those of you who've heard him will know that he's got little life stories that he tells, and this is all um, short essays. 
He is an American who lives in Britain and he's lived here for a long time now. Um, and he lives in, I think he lives in Sussex. And he produces wonderful humour about day-to-day -day events in his life. And these are nice little uh, chapters that you can read just before you go to bed or read to cheer you up and they will um, they will make you laugh and, and I think you'll really enjoy them. And if you ever get a chance to listen to him on the radio or go to one of his shows, I would recommend it. So that's David Sedaris, the best of me. Okay. Right, well I have another poem. I have got two more books to share with you later on, but I thought we'd have a have another poem first. So the poem I've got next is by Gerald Manley Hopkins and it's called The Wind Ho Wind Hover. And this refers to those wonderful birds, uh, kestrels who funny enough I saw one just the just yesterday on the way to work and they're often around um, Stonehenge hovering in the sky there, um, concentrating on some poor vole or mouse or whatever that they're trying to get below. Um, so this is Gerald Manley Hopkins, The Wind Hover. I caught this morning, this morning's morning's minion, kingdom of daylight's dauphin, dapple drawn drawn falcon in his riding, of the rolling level under, underneath him steady air and striding, high there, how he rung upon the rein of a winkling wing, in his ecstasy then off, off forth on swing, as a skate heel sweeps smooth on a bow bend, the hurl and gliding rebuffed the big wind, my heart in hiding stirred for a bird, the achieve of the mastery of the thing. Brute beauty, valour and act, O oh, air pride plume here, buckle and the fire that breaks from thee then, a billion times told lovelier, more dangerous, O oh, my chevalier, no wonder of it, sheer plod makes plough down cilium. Shine and blue bleak embers are my dear, fall and gall themselves and gash gold vermilion. So that was Gerald Manny Hopkins, The Wind Hover. Okay, and often um, when I'm travelling across the plain, I see a kestrel, and other things that I often see across the plain are barns, and there's plenty of barns on windswept hills or stuck in the middle of nowhere. Um, so I thought, I was looking through poems to choose, and I came across Edward Thomas, The Barn and the Down, and I thought, ah, oh, that's, that's Wiltshire, The Barn and the Down, is often a barn on top of a hill, so I thought we'd try that. So this is Edward Thomas, The Barn and the Down. It stood in the sunset sky, like the straight backed down, many a time the barn at the edge of town. So huge and dark that it seemed, it was the hill, till the gable's precipice proved it impossible. Then the great down in the west grew into sight, a barn sto stored full to the ridge with black of night. And the barn fell to a barn, or even less before critical eyes and its own late mightiness. But far down and near barn and I, since then have smiled, having seen my new cautiousness by itself beguiled, to disdain what seemed the barn, till a few steps changed, it passed all doubt to the down, so the barn was avenged. That was The Barn and Down by Edward Thomas. Okay, so I was mentioning two books just now that I wanted to share with you, and part of our um, fantastic new non-fiction um, selection that we bought for Salisbury Library. Two more I thought I'd share with you. This one is called She Speaks and it's by um, Yvette Cooper and uh, I'm sure you know she's the Shadow um, Home Secretary and this is Women's Speeches That Changed the World from Pankhurst to Thunberg um, so this is quite a good book to dip into and it starts with Boudicca or Boudicca Queen Elizabeth I and goes on to Benazir Bhutto and Theresa May, Angela Merkel. Um, so there's a whole range of people here um, and their speeches and a little bit about them. Um, so I would suggest that this is um, a good book to dip into. 
Uh, and like with all these books, you can jump across from subject to subject. So if you don't like one, you like them, you'll soon like the next one because it's something different. So that is She Speaks by Yvette Cooper, and it's women's speeches that change the world from Pankhurst to Thunberg. My final book recommendation is Skylarks with Rosie, A Somerset Spring. And this is by Stephen Moss. This has got a beautiful cover with a, something like a magpie on the front of it. Um, and this is a book that you will take out and it reminds you that spring is coming. And it progresses through spring and features a different bird or animal um, in, week, in the week of the spring. So week one starts with a black cat week two with the swallow, and then it moves on to week six, the wheat year. Week ten, the cop chafer, and that's those huge made bugs that you get that sometimes crash into a car at night. Week twelve, the night jar, um, and it's got an epilogue about the summer solstice and a postscript, the winter solstice. So it's a beautiful short book, and it'll just get you all excited and ready um, for the weeks that are to come, and to look forward to as spring gets ever closer. So that is Skylarks with Rosie, A Somerset Spring, by Stephen Moss. Okay, well, um, as you may know, this is uh, these tea and chat sessions are part of our Reading Well offer. And these are talks and events to encourage people to read uh, for their well-being. And we always like to have something that cheers you up and makes you laugh, so I thought we'd finish with one of my favourites and this is Edward Lear and it's the Quangle Wangle's Hat. On top of the crumpety tree the Quangle Wangle sat but his face you could not see on account of his beaver hat for his hat was 102 feet wide with ribbons and bibbons on either side and bows and buttons and loops and lace so that nobody could ever see the face of the Quangle Wangle Quee. The Quangle Wangle said to himself on the crumpety tree, Jam and jelly and bread are the best of food for me. But the longer I live on this crumpety tree, the plainer that ever it seems to me that very few people come this way and life on the whole is far from gay, said the Quangle Wangle Quee. But they came to the crumpety tree, Mr and Mrs Canary, and they said, Did ever you see any spot so charmingly airy? May we build a nest on your lovely hat, Mr Quangle Wangle grant us that. Oh, please let us come and build a nest of whatever material suits you best, Mr. Quangle Wangle Quee. And besides the crumpety tree came the stork, the duck and the owl, the snail and the bumblebee, the frog and the thimble fowl. The thimble fowl with the corkscrew leg and all of them said, we humbly beg, we may build out our homes on your lovely hat. Mr. Quangle Wangle grant us that, Mr. Quangle Wangle Quee. And the golden grouse came there and the pobble who has no toes, and the small Olympian bear, and the don with a luminous nose, and the blue baboon who played the flute, and the orange calf in the land of toot, and the attery squash and the bisky bat all came and built on the lovely hat of the quangle wangle quee. And the quangle wangle said to himself on the crumpety tree, when all these creatures move, what a wonderful noise there'll be. And at night, by the light of the mulberry moon, they danced the flute of the blue baboon on the broad green leaves of the crumpety tree, and all were happy as happy could be with the quangle wangle quee. Isn't that fantastic? The way that rolls and uh, rhymes, that was lovely. And that is The Quangle Wangle's Hat by Edward Lear. Okay, well, um, thank you very much for joining me this afternoon. Um, We'll have another tea and chat in a fortnight, and I think it might be Steph, possibly, from Melchior Library. Uh, but look out on our Facebook pages for all our online activities. We're still doing um, online rhyme times at the moment, because we've just paused it for the time being when the COVID rates are a bit higher. So look out for them. They're on a Monday morning at 11 o'clock. More details are on our Facebook pages. And also look out for our book chat groups. There's one in Melksham, there's one in Chippenham, there's one in Warminster, and Salisbury and Walton have one. And if you like talking about books and sharing your favourite uh, new books and your favourite book-related tales and libraries and stories, book chat groups are for you. And they're at Salisbury, Chippenham, Melksham and Warminster. OK, well, all it remains for me to say is to wish you um, a good afternoon. And I look forward to seeing you next time I do my next team chat. Take care. Thanks then. Bye.